What's going on YouTube? Welcome to another portrait painting tutorial. Today we are going to get into a couple different topics, but the primary one is going to be focused on paint handling. In particular, Alla Prima. But there are going to be a lot of topics that uh, were suggested in the past. I just couldn't fit all of them in the title. And I didn't want to repeat some of them in the title either. So, um, hello there to who is attending here, Stephanie Thompson. Hello there. Hey, Diane. So, Alla Prima. First thing to talk about is going to be the tone of your surface and whether you're going to use an active tone or a not an active tone. So, an active tone is a tone that is active, meaning it is going to interact with the layers that you add on to it. So, think about the famous Bob Ross. He would be an example of an active tone meaning he would paint onto his magic white paint, as he called it. For us, it's going to be just thin, uh, kind of warm gray paint. So I used, um, that was, uh, I believe it was ultramarine blue and um, cadmium red. Ultramarine blue, cadmium red, and white. And now we're using just a kind of simple brownish mixture to start to do the sketch. Um, uh, hey Lady Death, hi Sarah, hey Canvas Dancer. So we are using a very simple, kind, almost kind of a violet type of color. So a couple things we're going to cover here. Uh, again, paint handling. We're going to back go back into um, different skin tones, how to achieve different skin tones. And then we're gonna go to eye expression expression with eyes so uh, a lot of things uh, to, to talk about here hey job good job so um let's get into what the painting is going to eventually look like so uh, this one is going to be one of my looser ones so um yeah don't don't hate me for it it's going to be much much i guess less finished than what you're used to with me so this is what the painting will eventually look like so you see the eyebrows the expression that I wanted to capture. So this is where we're heading in about uh, one hour from now. That's what we're going to have. So don't hate me. I wanted to do something even more expressive. So that's what you're going to start seeing from me. I want to do more and more uh, kind of expressive stuff, a little bit less realistic, just because I want to, uh, just because I want to get to that, that level where I can kind of just loosen up. Um, Hey, Faye, you were just thinking about this technique today. Oh, good, good. So let's talk about that technique and what, uh, there are many ways to approach it. Um, so if you're going to do Alla Prima and you choose to use an active tone like this, which is very popular, a lot of people use it these days, uh, make sure that your uh, canvas is uh, a good quality one. I would suggest a linen. It would be a little difficult to do this with a cotton canvas because the cotton will start to absorb it a lot. So uh, I would highly suggest to use a linen. And um, these linen canvases are actually glued onto panels. I have the exact information in the description box of this video. Uh, but this is a um, Centurion linen glued onto a panel. And you can buy them in, I think, three packs. And they end up being something like three or four dollars a panel uh, when you buy them in in packs. So not that expensive and very very um, good to store. If you paint a lot of paintings, they they're really um, you just stack them on each other, and it's much less surface area, much less real estate than uh, the thickness of a canvas. A canvas dancer. Oh, thank thanks for that comment. So for Alla Prima, with an active tone, you're going to want to be a little bit looser because it's going to slip around more. The paint is going to be much more slippery. And um, you want to cover the um, entire circumference of the head, meaning the envelope. The envelope is very important with Alla Prima. With Alla Prima, meaning done all at once in one sitting which is how i do most of well it's how i do all of my youtube demos now in in particular there's a speed factor to it and we're going to talk about the speed factor 
along with painting um, very quickly like this. Hey, Steven. Oh, no worries. No worries. I'm glad that you were painting. And we, we just started like a couple minutes ago. You're not late. Hey, Max. Uh, let's see. Can you please put the canvas link in the description? Um, I can I can look it up for you. It's I found it in um in um I, I bought it from Jerry's Artorama, so I can type that out for you. Let's see if I can even spell it. If you're in the U.S., uh, if you're not in the U.S., then I would use Jackson's. Jackson's is the one that everyone uses if you're not in the US. But that's where I got it from, was from that site. So if you type up linen panels, if, if you like copy and paste what I put in the description, you'll find it. So we got into color really quickly there. So um, let's backtrack a second there. What did I do for the color? I don't want to leave you, leave you hanging there. So first I was testing something out that was too warm. So I actually went with a lizard and cadmium red so a lizard cadmium red and green so the green that i have is a verona green earth which is standing in place for viridian but these skin colors you can actually start with a lizard permanent and viridian a lizard permanent and viridian get you more of a neutral warm um, darker color as opposed to what i used last time which was um Daxazine purple and cadmium yellow. So this is another way you can get there. Uh, hey Ziomara. Oh, thank you. Thanks for joining. You're actually the second person I've met with that name. And she was pronounced Ziomara, I remember. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but um, but that's how I remember. So now we're going in with, again, pretty much the similar color, a lizard and permanent and green. So a lizard and permanent and green in, in different quantities along with the colors that already are on the palette. So it may look kind of strange, the technique here with Ala Prima, because he's facing closer to centered, it's much harder. So what you're do what you're seeing there, it looks a little scary, but what, what these are are blocks for the eye sockets. And for Ala Prima, I suggest you do this because it's easier to paint into it as opposed to spending a long time. You can do this many ways, right? Uh, you, you can draw the daylights out of it with uh, your umber drawing, which you've seen me do, do plenty of times in the past, and then paint into it. But what I'm doing is I put a big block in place so it's easier for me to sculpt around. And the paint consistency is very heavy, very thick paint for this. So Max Muster, if you don't do Ala Prima, how long do you need to wait for the next layer? Well, I mean, if you've got a slow dryer, you can paint the next day because it'll probably be wet. Um, meaning if you use oil paint that's um, that has like... Um, Walnut oil in it, it'll probably be wet for a couple days. Clove oil, it may be wet for like a couple years. That's an exaggeration, but a long time. Um, however, if you're using regular linseed oil paints, then you want to uh, wait probably uh, three to four days. It should be touch dry. Uh, but just run a palette knife across the side, and if nothing comes off, then you're good to go. But three to four days is what I would suggest. Um, if you use Alkit, then it'll be dry the next day, you know. But uh, three to four days. And those dark marks for the nose are going to be my accent marks that are going to help me place. I have an idea of where the placement of the features are going to go. Hey, Diego. Hey, Shavu. Thanks for watching from India. What's going on, legendary noob? I'm glad that you are here. Oh, no worries, no worries, Max. So, um, with Ala Prima, the important concepts to, to see and to take note of at this point is that you're 
it's a very much a construction process in that you're laying down the foundation of the layers that are going to go on top. And because this is Alo Primo wet on wet, you have to plan out ahead of time how you're going to layer on top of this layer. So the thicker you paint, the more of the paint will grip. So you want this to be a, a layer that grips on nicely to the layers that are going to be on top. If I make this layer too thin, then it's going to be harder. The paint's going to be slipping around. Cover as much surface area as you can and work with big, broad planes and build into it is a much more uh, efficient way to work. It's not easier. It's harder, actually, but it's more efficient to work this way. Hey, and Pot. Oh, good, good, Zilmar. I pronounced your name correctly. Awesome. Legendary Noob, he wrote, I've been working on a painting for a couple of layers. I'm confused about fat uh, over lean. Should you use linseed oil on the last layers or just paint, paint uh, by itself? Well, fat over lean, um, it means, well, the purpose of fat over lean is to make sure that your finished painting has a very sturdy paint film. What you see here is now I'm starting to mix the background. So that is um, that is white, which is flake white replacement, which is basically just a titanium white that's made to act like lead white and ultramarine blue, mostly that. So uh, I would um, I would suggest in the beginning use no medium for the first maybe like two to three layers, and then you can introduce um, like something like a liquid or a, a neo megil. In theory, liquid you can use right away because it's a fast dryer if you want to. And then um, say layers three through, I don't know, five or seven, you want to slowly start to use a slower dryer. Or you don't have to change the medium at all. You can actually just use the same medium and make sure that it is thin. The only way you can go wrong with fat over lean is if you start with a slow dryer and you end with a fast dryer. That's the only way you can go wrong. So basically don't start with linseed oil and switch to something like uh, liquid. You can start with something like liquid and then somewhere along the line finish with linseed oil. Uh, if you think about the old masters and some painters today, myself included, can work on a painting uh, for more than a year. So how do you go about working on a painting for more than a year? Are you gonna be like a, like a, uh, are you gonna be like in a lab coat, like trying to figure out precisely solve, um, do a differential equation and and solve for exactly how much. Uh, oil is in your your paint. No, it's not going to be that precise. So it, basically, if you just use the same like uh, Neo McGillip or or liquid or something for, for for like a year, and you make sure your paint is thoroughly dry, you're going to be okay. You're you're not going to have any cracking problems. At least you shouldn't. You really shouldn't. Um, so for question from Max. So let's, let's get into a little bit of a description of what's going on here. So I put in these dark accents right away, which breaks away from uh, light and shadow. So I took a gamble with this. Um, I broke a rule. So I'm kind of, well, you see the shadow shape is there, but um, there's still not any light around the mouth. So it's a little bit confusing at this point, but I'm doing that around this perimeter of the face as you see the finished result. So I'm gonna go around from the bottom and push my way out towards the middle. And I'm using the nose to help me pinpoint the perspective of the face. That's why it looks like that. Um, so let's see, a question from uh, Max was, I have problems to make the painting 3D in some areas in Ala Prima because layering in Ala Prima is difficult. I just started oil painting some days ago. Well, yeah, for sure. Uh, Aloprima was 
Yeah, Al Primo trying to make things look 3D can be difficult, but sometimes it can be easier with um with uh with Al Primo. In particular, um I have my I have my students start out with um very simple exercises like painting spheres and making the spheres look round in Al Prima. And then um, when they get into um, like painting a forehead or something like that, it, they are just working on the forehead and it's going to be wet on wet. Um, it is wet on wet. So um, it's more about working with something simpler like a sphere, knowing how to make that look round and then going into something that has planes to it. Uh, that's what I would suggest. So for Max, if the first layer is dry, then you don't have to follow fat over lean rule. Well, technically, yeah. I, I mean, completely dry. However, you still, you still typically, you don't want to, um, for example, like, you don't want to start off a painting with linseed oil. Some people do that, but I wouldn't suggest it. Because the oil paints already have linseed oil in them, so you don't want to add more linseed oil to them. Um, but in theory, yes, but in practice, no. I wouldn't suggest um, trying to uh, add a, a, a slow dryer and then a fast dryer. So basically, think about it like uh, think about it like gears of a car if you if you drive a stick shift, I guess most people don't these days, but First gear has a lot of acceleration as soon as you're starting. If you try to start a car in like fifth gear, if you have a five speed like me, it's not gonna go anywhere. It's gonna be very slow. So fast and then slow. That's a better way to think about fat over lean. Think about fast and then slow in terms of drying speed. And uh, that'll simplify fat over lean for you much, much faster. Uh, so for Max, let's see. One layer liquid, uh, second layer paint, third layer paint, uh, plus linseed. You could do that, yeah. You could do that, but you don't have to be that meticulous about when you get into linseed oil. I usually wait a long time, to be honest, before I get into linseed. But that, that could work as well if you're only going to have a couple layers. But, but like I said, it, it's not that clinical. You're not going to see painters around, well, in, you might, but... Typically, you're not going to see painters around in a lab coat uh, having some, uh, like I said, some differential equations on the board or uh, working out some general relativity and using metric tensors uh, and uh, trying to figure out like exactly like how much oil there is in the, they're not going to, it's not going to be that precise. So you don't, don't stress too much about it. Oh, thank you, uh, Legendary Noob. Good morning, Daniel. No worries, Max. Hopefully that helps. Hey, Elena. Thanks for watching from Brazil. Now, Aloprima, a very, very uh, versatile way of painting. I'm painting this like block like big blocks you see the nose is a triangle the forehead is somewhat of a trapezoid with light on the globella the mouth is kind of like a rectangle two two rectangles the cheekbone just has one big broad brush stroke light is coming from the top right of his head shadow is casted on the bottom left at this point, I must emphasize with any technique that you do, light and shadow are the most important things. Your values should be very simple. Your values should be no more than five different uh, major value differentiation. Think about it as five values and some edges. Five values and some edges. Now, the color is very unique here. That we're using a different skin complexion than you've probably seen me do before though it looks kind of similar with my light i should have adjusted my light a little bit but um the main mixtures are done with red and green a lizard and permanent and viridian will get you these colors but for the most part i'm using a lizard and permanent and a color that's called verona green earth 
I'm trying to basically run out of that green tube before I buy another one. That's just the way I am these days. I'm trying not to spend uh, that much before buying more paints. The uh, planes of the face are big and they're generalized. So the head is generalized in a blocky fashion. The more you keep your shapes simple and blocky, the key word with Alla Prima for today is not so much super specificity, but blocky. And for those of those of you starting out portrait painting, let me tell you one of the first first things I will suggest to you is do not paint someone that you know. If you're starting out portrait painting, do not paint someone that you know. Remember this. I'm going to repeat myself like a like a like a parrot, like some kind of bird. If you're starting out portrait painting, do not paint someone you know. Did I make that mistake? Oh yeah. When I started out a portrait painting like 14 years ago, uh, I painted my mom from life, and she laughed at the thing, and I destroyed it. By destroying it, meaning I painted over it. Um, and then I eventually started going to painting groups, and uh, it was easier to paint people that I didn't know. Because there is a, something psychological with portrait painting, unlike anything else. Alla prima portrait painting in general is a very risky subject, um, and I've been doing this now for weeks, consistently with the schedule, by the way, um, and in case you're just tuning in, 10, 15 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time every Tuesday is when you will find me uh, live streaming a video just like this one. So, um, Alla Prima portrait painting is a very fun thing. It's kind of like the Wild West of, of painting. There's really nothing like it. If you do an Alla Prima portrait or if you do an ala prima painting of like a still life or a landscape or a pet portrait you know the pressure is not that intense but if you do it uh, of a portrait it's an intense pressure but the pressure can actually make you better uh, if you do these exercises and again i'm posting these finished paintings on my instagram and eventually I'll start posting them on a website and eventually selling these things. Um, hey Hades, yep, color contrast, very, very important. Uh, being able to make sure your colors are contrasty, which I didn't mention actually. You can see the contrasty and kind of like that violet uh, violetish red on the cheekbone, kind of more orangey towards the maxilla over here, contrasting with the light of the blue of the background, exactly what you mean there. So a question from Diane. See, uh, did you try painting with only walnut alkyd medium? I found it close to egg tempera painting. Um, let's see. Mm, I have used walnut alkyd medium in the past. Uh, it's a little bit of a darker walnut. I'm usually used to like that, that very like very light walnut uh, medium. I've tried it in the past, um, and I find I found that it doesn't. It starts to tack up faster, but over the time, like, it took the same, like, couple days for it to, to dry as regular. Uh, so I stopped kind of, I stopped using it, but I used it years ago. Um, but it did have a kind of nice kind of melted butter, like, um, like flow to it. Um, and, and yeah, Hades, I'm trying to give you as many as I can but but painting art on its own is actually a very subjective thing um, but objectively speaking in terms of paint handling and shapes uh, we're now starting to subdivide the shapes into uh, more anatomically significant shapes I mean they're all anatomically significant but uh, you see some planes starting to emerge where the cheekbones these lighter planes. Now, when it comes to darker skin color, um, the highlights, the light lights are going to be significantly brighter than the middle lights. So that's going to be something to uh, to take note of. Let's see a question from Max. Uh, let's see, you painted an Ala Prima for more than eight hours. You felt like 
uh, let's say, felt like I ruined it and made many mistakes, big mistakes. Uh, structured, uh, structured canvas, uh, no straight lines possible. Uh, so from Max, do you recommend to blend colors in the beginning, beginning and how to blend? All right, no problems. Oh, thanks, Max. Uh, so in the beginning, if you're just starting out painting, um, I would highly suggest that you, if you're going to do portrait, I do suggest that you do um, a contra, you do a balance between drawing in outlines and then drawing with mass. This is the same with, um, this can be the same with uh, if, when you're using paint or if you're using pencil. Um, I would suggest to do both. So do one that's like very, very structured with the lines and then do another that's like this, which is kind of like getting the paint to like very smooth, very f flowy. Max, what I would suggest for you and for everyone else is uh, with these videos that I'm making uh, for YouTube, you can do things like this. You can pause it, right? And uh, you can follow along with it. And I'm posting the uh, finished picture on my Instagram. So I'm doing this deliberately so that uh, people can follow along and paint with me. And you see that most of the mixtures are done on the right side of the palette. That's something I finally learned how to do. And the background is on the left side of the palette. Uh, so the words on the chat are not blocking most of the skin tone mixtures there. Uh, but to, to get those kind of like blended out edges, I actually don't blend to create um, a, a value. You see there, I add it. And then blending, I usually do only when the planes are there. So think about it. Some people call it tiles, if that's useful for you. Think about it like tiles, like I'm picking up a tile, I'm putting it down, picking up another tile, putting it down, and then I smoothen out the edge in between. For example, the edge of the nose right there, that's like putting down a tile right there and then I will smoothen out that edge eventually next to the highlight, for example. Uh, let's see, so from Janet, do you recommend painting yourself when you begin painting? Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, Self-portraits are the best way to, um, to introduce yourself to portraiture because it allows you to paint from light, paint yourself from a mirror, and uh, it is one of the best things for you to do because you're a free model. I'm assuming you don't have to pay yourself to, to pose a free model. And you get the paint from life. It doesn't get any better than that. Self-portraits are definitely the best way to go. Uh, I definitely agree with you there, uh, Janet. So from Hades, uh, did you use purple and burnt sienna in the darker portions of the portrait? So mainly I'm using the complementary colors, in particular a lot of red and green, alizarin and viridian, but then for the lighter colors it's um, it's white added into um, dioxazine purple and cadmium yellow. So yeah, there is some purple in there, but the purple on its own I won't do. It's purple and yellow. So the colors are killed off. You see right there red again and then green. Red and then green are uh, most of what I'm using here because it's it's kind of a warmer warmer kind of dark color. Hey Jonas. Oh, thank you, Max. I'm glad that you're enjoying these videos. Um, so, so once, once more, everyone, these videos are made for you to recreate the paintings. And uh, if you want to share them with us, uh, you can you can do that with the uh, the Facebook group that's posted in the uh, description box of the video. If you want to get feedback from me uh, for only ten dollars a month, there's my online classes. Uh, you get feedback directly from me, 
with your projects but uh you know if you're on a budget if you you know if you if you're on a budget you don't have to pay anything uh for these videos they're on youtube completely free for you the instagram again is completely free for you um so you're gonna have the picture you can print it out whatever you want to do and um you're able to recreate these paintings and what i'm trying to do every week is introduce more variety into them um the more variety the better i think um at least that's what i'm trying to do uh to do for you hey lucas thanks for watching from brazil is the amara uh let's see the wild west yeah ala prima portrait is the wild west Hey David, I'm good. I'm good. Um, hope everyone is doing well. So back to the main topic at hand with Ala Prima. I'm sneaking up on the features. So the nose, uh, hopefully I correct it at some point. Uh, yeah, I do. So the wing of the nose on the on his left is a little bit a uh, little bit crooked there, but I will get to it eventually. So what I'm doing is I'm sneaking up to the features. So I'm working all the shapes around the features. Um, and I'm, I focused more with the placement of the nose. There we go. I'm synchronized with the, uh, the me from last week. <laughs> so uh, I quickly went and fixed that there. So I'm sneaking my way around the mask of the face. As you see there, I'm starting to, the more planes I add, the more smooth it starts to become. I'm deliberately adding the planes and I'm not going in with, say, like a, a, a soft brush and blending them. I'm adding more paint to the mix and uh, using that to move the paint around and get it to flow. Hey, Sarah. Uh, oh. Thank you for joining the, the Patreon. Are you in the, which which tier are you in? Are you in the, the $10 and up one or which tier? But for the Facebook, uh, so the Facebook for the general public, the free one, it's linked in the description box of the video. But there is a Facebook group that's a private Facebook group for my online students only. That's called the Virtual Classroom Facebook group. That one, if you don't have access to it, hit me up on the Patreon and I will send you the link to it right away. But that one, I have to send right away. And if you just joined like last night, um, so for everyone, uh, please take note that I don't have an automated response system on Patreon. So if you join when I'm away from the computer or when I'm asleep, I typically don't... Um, get back to you until I get back to the computer. So uh, now I started to put in the features of the face. Now let me let me pause it. Um, so public service announcement here. So those of you that joined my Patreon and then I didn't respond to you for like a day or an hour, I was away from my computer. So on the weekend, I'm away from the computer. And in between, say, like 10 p.m. and like like 8 a.m. or something like that, I'm typically asleep. So if I don't respond to you, it's not because I don't want to respond to you. It's because I'm away from the computer. But I typically do respond uh, right away. So Sarah, all right, so you're in the $10. And, all right, so I got my notepad, and I'm going to write myself a reminder. So right after this ends, I'm going to send you the link to... Uh, I'm going to send you the link to the virtual classroom. I also send everyone in the $10 um, the playlists for all of the uh, painting projects as well. So that will be sent to you right away. So as soon as I'm done here, I'll send it to you. Um, let's see. Uh, now I'm starting to pinpoint the eyes. So that happened really quickly. So uh, what we did was we put the dark for the eyes first and then now we started to put the light of the eyes and i waited a pretty long time 
which I guess is not that long of a time, but I waited 33 minutes, which is about halfway through this video. So halfway through the video, I waited to throw down the eyes. Uh, yeah, no worries, uh, Sarah. And Sarah and everyone else that's in the $10 a month tier. Another public service announcement. I'm going to pause the video right now, and I'm going to show you my schedule. So um, pause the video for a second so that you don't miss anything. Show you my schedule. So Monday, so everything in black is for Patreon. So Monday is the basic level lessons. Friday is intermediate to advanced. These are painting projects, and I create playlists so that you can watch them uh, later on. They're also streamed live for uh, those of you in the live stream tier, which is um, uh, the tier above $10 a month. But what's interesting here is this one right here. So this is new here. You see the Wednesday? Look at the bottom left of my screen. Wednesday, live chat check-in, alternating weeks, which means every other week, just about every other week, we do a live chat on Zoom. So if you're watching this live right now and you want to hang out with me this Wednesday on Zoom, you can do that by joining the $10 a month tier right here, this one right there. I have already posted the Patreon post. Uh, so if you join, say right now, the uh, $10 a month tier this Wednesday, meaning tomorrow at 10 a.m., you can hang out with me on Zoom. And the purpose for that is to get feedback from you. What do you like? What do you not like about the online classes? What would you like me to do? What would you like me to, to implement future projects? Things like that. So um, that's a little public service announcement for you there. So that is what the painting will eventually get to in 30 minutes. So now we are in the stage in this painting where as soon as I start to throw the eyes in, the eyes are almost like darts. Uh, but I want to make sure that when I throw the dart, for the eyes, I land in the somewhat correct vicinity. And now I'm going to start to smoothen out planes, add them in, move things around, and start to make it more and more refined. So that's what we're going to get to now at this point. With the refinement, typically I say not a lot of things happen in a... Um, not a lot of stuff happens in a short amount of time. I'm trying to change that. A lot of things do happen still in a short amount of time. With Ella Prima, when you're in this stage, you need to decide what creates the biggest impact with the least amount of work with Ella Prima. So what that boils down to is one very important element. And most of us are not staying further back from their paintings as they need to. For one, do you ever see my head get in the way of the camera shot? When I was first filming these in my new apartment, yeah, my head was getting in the way because I didn't stand back enough for this camera shot. So stay further back make your decisions from a distance and then you make you make your decisions from a distance then put them down an arm's length away there's never a time in ala prima there should never be a time in ala prima where you're like this close to your um to your uh painting you shouldn't be that close to your painting so um, now what we're doing with the painting in general is we're starting to add the dark for the, um, the, the forehead. So kind of like these lines, I, I have them, just not as pronounced, the lines on my forehead. Another part of this painting is the topic of eye expression, expression through the eyes. So expression through the eyes means the eyebrows are raised. I like the way he looks with his expression with his eyes. Um, so his eyes are raised, which also creates these creases on his forehead. How do you paint the creases on the forehead? Well, first you paint in the eyes, right? Those, And it's just a simple little shape for the eyes, the eye socket. Then almost like um, waves. 
think about this like waves to an ocean. You paint in the dark lines, the creases for the dark lines, and then you go in with the lights. Follow the form. Look how the brush is following the form. The specific trajectory of the form and uh, and it begins to flow. Now I'm going to ask you all a very important question because this is going to determine what I'm going to paint next. So I'm going to ask everyone, what would you like me? And we're still going to continue talking about Alla Prima uh, because that's, that was the main topic here. But we're also going to still talk about um, the uh, skin colors because this is very important. When you're painting darker skin colors, the contrast between the light and the mid-tones is stronger than uh, with different skin complexions. With the, uh, that's about the values with darker skin colors. The mixtures are mainly alizarin and green, and then in the light, it's purple and yellow with, with, uh, with white. Hey, NLMB, watching this during literature class. Awesome, awesome, awesome. You rebel, you. Trust me, I did the same thing when I was in class. I remember I was, uh, well, back when I was in class, smartphones were just coming out. Uh, but, um, yeah, I remember watching YouTube videos when I was in class, uh, putting it on silent and uh, putting my head down. I would have my phone. Uh, I'm setting a bad example for everyone. I would have my head down and my phone was sandwiched in between my binder. I <laughs> I used to do the same thing, man. I used to do the same thing. That is so funny. Um, so, Jonas, let's see. Uh, oh, you know what? Now these days you have those Bluetooth, right? You can, If you have long hair like me, you can hide the Bluetooth in your hair. Uh, we didn't have the earbuds when I was in high school. Now we're throwing in the accents. Hey there, Angry Bird. Uh, so we throw in those accents for the eyes. Uh, the, the eye socket there. Legendary New Year, but you would love to see an Ella Prima landscape. That is a possibility, but I will tell you, Legendary Noob, I typically tend to lose um, followers when I do a landscape. Go figure, I don't know, people don't like seeing me paint landscape. Um, but what I could do, Legendary Noob, is put a landscape as a background to a portrait. I could do that if you want me to. Um, it will still be more focused on the portrait, but I can throw a landscape in there. Uh, but for some reason, I do lose viewers when I do that. Hey, Tipu, still I have fruits like plums? Okay. Well, if this is what you want me to do, uh, I could do it for you. I will tell you, I typically tend to lose viewers when I don't do portrait. Um, it's a possibility. So, landscape and or still life. Possibility, possibility there. So, let's see, how many people do we have here? We've got about 40 people watching this live. So, I want to see 40 different comments. What would you like me to focus on next time? Hey, NLMB. Uh, yep, learning either way. I got you. I got you. I wonder, do you got the earbuds on? Is that how you're you're getting away with the audio? That would be pretty cool, uh, pretty like a, like a 007 kind of thing. So from Red Angry Birds, Still Life. Once again, we got two votes here for Still Life. One vote for uh, Landscape. So currently we've got uh, two for Still Life, one for Landscape. From Sarah, you'd see you like more old master portraits, although you've, I've recently done Rembrandt. Vermeer would be amazing. Yeah, Vermeer would take a lot longer. But let me tell you something, Sarah, since you're in the online classes, we did a uh, the the milkmaid, fully completed milkmaid on Patreon. That one took months to complete, but um, you will get that playlist. So, Sarah, uh, since you enjoy Vermeer, yeah, there is the milkmaid. There's also a girl with the pearl earring is also on the Patreon, so you will enjoy that uh Hopefully, you will enjoy that. And that's much more of a long-term uh, painting than these are. So, for the Alla Prima, we're starting to throw almost like darts. We're starting to throw the highlights in there. And we're uh, starting to put in the lights for the 
for the features. Now it's going to start to be refined. We've got highlight and we've got dark, accent and shadow. Everything in between is now going to create the fullness of the form. Adding in uh, a little bit less thick paint with smaller brushes is key. Remember first it was bigger brushes and thicker paint. Now it's smaller brushes and less paint. So uh, from Tipo, if portraits, could you paint the known actor to see how the likeness is achieved? All right, Tipo, that one I can't do because of copyright, because you probably got to make a living somehow. So if I do a painting of like Brad Pitt, or uh, if I do a painting of like uh, Jim Carrey, or um, Jennifer Lopez, or Shakira, or something like that, I will get demonetized, my friend. I will get demonetized. Uh, even if I don't put, even if I don't monetize it, I will still get in trouble on YouTube. So that one, I don't think I can do, Tipu, because I will be in trouble of losing my YouTube channel, and uh, that would be very, very bad. So yeah, sorry about that. That that one is one that I I definitely will get in trouble with YouTube. So Christopher, uh, does Velasquez do a la prima? Or does he layer? He does have an Ala Prima touch, uh, but he does do a layered process with it. And uh, pretty much all the old masters did use Ala Prima, even Bugaro, if you zoom into how they painted. But what they did was they would do an underpainting, and then typically with the underpainting, they would add in wet on wet paint um, later on. Because wet on wet paint is actually the easiest way to control your edge work than wet on dry. Hey, Tipu, then paint Albert Einstein. <laughs> it's a possibility, but again, known celebrity. I don't think there's any copyright. I like your idea. I need to paint someone prior to 1920. Even then, someone can own copyrights to, like, Benjamin Franklin or something like that. Um, or George Washington, or like... I like your idea. Um, I'd have to think about it because it's a very risky thing. Uh, likeness of someone, someone famous, that would be very difficult uh, to avoid copyright. I gotta do more research, Tipu. I gotta do research because I, at the moment I don't have the answer for you because I don't know. YouTube is very strict these days. Um, the internet is very strict. Um, so I gotta be very careful with that. Missy Omara. Oh, good. I'm glad you liked my explanations for this. Oh, no worries. I'll catch you next time, same time next week. It was nice to have you here. Hey, Janet. A portrait of myself. I actually did do one, not that long ago. I did do um. A self-portrait one not too long ago. And it's in the same format, too. Uh, and I did that one also for uh, likeness. So uh, that one was a couple of videos ago. And uh, I do have a playlist. I should probably... I think I linked it in the description box, but there should be a playlist with these live streams. And uh, if it's not in the description box, let me know. And uh, I will go ahead and add it in there. But it's called uh, Yupari something live painting sessions. But I did do the self-portrait one. Now we're starting with the uh, technique here. We've got about 23 minutes till we're going to start to add the refinement. So we're going with the light into the middle tones. And the, the focus here is with edges. And the edges are going to be very important. Remember, think about just five values and some edges. Five values and some edges. Hey, Christopher. Let's see. Didn't know portraits of known people get you a strike. Another YouTuber does it and many others. Yeah, they're gambling. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're taking risks. And uh, I guess they know that the clout will pay for itself. I mean, yeah. Um, but... It's just too risky. I think it's too risky. They call it fan art. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it would just be too risky. A legendary noob. 
Copyright is such a pain uh, for the artist. I didn't know that, but how, let's see. Uh, another YouTuber does it and many others. Where did that comment go? I thought I was reading it. I thought I was reading a comment. And I lost it. But yeah, it's it's a copyright as a thing to really uh, to be careful of. But one uh, one of my objectives. Hey, hippie artist, no worries, no worries. We still got about twenty minutes, and this will be uh, available as a pre-recorded. Uh, another thing that I'm trying to do deliberately. What I'm trying to do is I'm deliberately trying to paint everyday people. So I'm trying to paint everyday people and not a specific person, which is why uh, the references for these paintings are pretty much a secret. Um, they're they're from copyright free sources, but let me tell you something. The likeness for, for these is not the uh, priority here. I did a video on likeness and I did a self-portrait with it because really self-portrait is the only way that I can do a video on likeness because when you want to do likeness, Remember, everyone, there's three dimensions to likeness. One-dimensional likeness is it looks just like the photograph. Two-dimensional likeness is it looks like the photograph and you captured an expression, one expression. Three-dimensional likeness is the key, is golden. Three-dimensional likeness is you captured character. You cannot capture someone's character fully from a photo reference. You can't, because when you're painting someone from life, what you're doing is you're not just capturing the moment, but you're capturing a series of moments, a series of micro-expressions. The micro-expressions are what gives you the character that the person has, because the person's character will only show through a series of different micro-expressions, which is why when you take a photograph of yourself, you, it, you know that's not what you look like. That's not what you look like. That's just what the camera says you look like through a bunch of different photons reacting with a sensor. But all that is is a moment. But what you actually look like is a series of moments together through the human eye. Uh, so let's see. Hey, Sarah, you love lost edges. Let's see. Now you know they're easier to achieve via Ala Prima. Oh, yeah. A lot easier to achieve. Now that we're talking about edges, uh, that's actually very important for what we're doing right now because again, five values and some edges. Now I've switched to a sable brush. That is a silver brush, uh, size four, cat's tongue shape brush. And I'm using it just, just kind of throw on some little cheerful shapes there for his hair. The sable brush is helping me get a, a very nice and fine point. And um, I'm putting dreads. So they're like little dreaded, uh, dreaded, not dreaded, but uh, like, uh, let's see, dread shapes here. So let's see, I'm pausing the video by mistake. So you see how he has these little shapes in his hair. Someone asked me to do braids last time. So I tried to do a little bit of everything with this, but you see light and dark patterns starting to emerge on, uh, on the painting. And I'm trying to paint different kind of hairstyles there. A legendary new oh no worries i was like where did that go i was reading it and it disappeared no worries yeah pexels um yeah pexels and unsplash those are the two that i use i also have pictures of people that i used to um uh, like references that i used to um uh paint from did i pause the footage yeah i did i'm on video no i didn't pause it it was just i was mixing for a long time Let's see here. So the sable brush, now that we're talking about Ala Prima, if you go from bristle and start with bristle and you finish with sable, it's going to be a lot easier for you. If you're using artist grade oil paint and you're working on linen, that is going to be vital to painting like this. And it's not that expensive. I mean, these canvases, if you buy them in bulk, the ones that I'm using, 
in bulk meaning like three packs they'll cost you about three to four dollars a canvas three to four dollars a canvas i'm using primarily gamblin and winsor newton paint they're not that expensive and i have uh, i shrank my palette down i condensed it to only the primaries and the secondaries which is a very difficult way uh, to go about learning portraiture but it is a very good way to go about learning color so if you want to know exactly what colors i'm using uh, again check the description box of the video they're typed up for you or if you want me to in the end i'll go over uh, all of the colors for you and again with ala prima we're adding in these planes smaller planes into bigger planes and you've heard me say this dozens of times before but one thing you haven't heard me say before is efficiency with the smaller planes when you're rendering things out not a lot of things happen in a long time but if you want a lot of things to happen in a short amount of time like just in the past 10 minutes a lot of stuff happened you know what this the key is the secret is the secret is to be very far back from your painting and you notice i never rested my pinky i usually rest my pinky on the canvases when i'm trying to get very nitty-gritty things with this one i deliberately and last week i deliberately try not to rest my pinky sometimes i may do it but i'm trying not to which means i'm staying further away Let's see. So from Joey Z, I was reading this one book that said Velasquez only used bristle for his work. Wonder if it's true. I'm, well, for one, uh, they didn't have synthetics back then. They didn't exist. So really, your only options were bristle or sable. From what I know, they had mongoose hair. They had uh, hog hair bristle. Um, but yeah, for the most part, he only really had access to sable or bristle so yeah i would think that he mainly used bristle uh, i think he would use bristle and stable uh same thing what i'm doing here so uh that's probably what he used i would say and uh they didn't have barrels like we have they actually had to tie down the hairs and mainly they only had rounds actually in the 17th century from what i heard from jay murray i would vote for a self-portrait with the landscape a landscape background um which i would be uh, which would be a lot to ask oh good i'm glad you like these videos i never thought of myself with a landscape background that would be a big one um i mean another self-portrait is possible but since i did one so recently i don't know but we'll see that that is an option there if you want me to do that so from Christopher, or is it like squirrel watercolor brushes? I don't think I've ever used, um, let's see, I've uh, never used touch a sable brush. I wonder, does it brush spring feel like a nylon? So Christopher, so a sable, it feels like a synthetic because it's a very, um, whoops, I forgot to turn off autofocus there. So a sable, it feels like a synthetic, but it holds more paint than a synthetic. So if you think about the individual fibers, um, they are thin, like a synthetic, but if you zoom into the fibers of a sable, they're more rigid, which allows them to hold more paint in the little pockets of the little ridges of the sable, whereas the synthetic is uh, a little bit less rigid, therefore it doesn't, the paint slips off a little bit more with uh, the synthetic, which means you have to add more paint to it more frequently than the, than the sable. So from Sarah, what about a portrait expressing an emotion? I know I'd find that tough, so just another idea. I like it, another idea there. So we've gotten, we've gotten a, a lot more for portrait, I guess, than landscape. And still life, um, meaning we've got, um, we've got, old master we've got self-portrait and now we've got portrait expressing an emotion so uh, i like that i like mm, let's see emotion 
that is a genuine possibility. I can, I've never done someone like really mad or like, um, an, like, like a super emotion. That's an idea. That's an idea. So from Jay Murray, uh, let's see, what size canvas would you have recommend to purchase in bulk? I've been doing a lot of landscapes on 9x12, but a portrait requires a larger space. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Fun fact. All of my paintings in the past two months have been on 8x10 inch canvases. 8x10 inch canvases. Yep. 8x10 inch canvases. You can get away with 8x10s. It is possible. What I recommend you, Jay Murray, if you got the space, 16x20 is a really good one because you can have head, shoulders in there with portrait. You can also do landscapes with it. It's a very versatile shape. 16x20 inches is what I would suggest you do. I wouldn't use it for a demo because it would take a long time. But... Um, 16 by 20 is what I would recommend you if you can. If not, 9 by 12 is perfectly fine, and you can even do 8 by 10 because that's what I'm doing. And uh, and yeah, from Joey, yeah, if you buy a linen roll, you will save money. Um, but then again, there's a lot of time involved in stretching the canvases, so that's up to you how you want to do it. Let's see. A legendary noob. Oh, thank you for that comment. I'm glad you like the uh, Ala Prima. Hey, Sarah, did I miss a question? I'm not sure. So from Jonas, do you know why some portraits are considered difficult to make, like angles, even though all the information is there? Is it uh, down to the experience? Um, experience plays a role, but I will tell you the most difficult portrait I've ever painted was a portrait of my wife's mom, so my mother-in-law. I painted her um, lot. I painted her in a, a painting video a long time ago, and I filmed the whole thing. And uh, I don't know why I did that to myself. That was the most difficult portrait I've ever done. So difficult portraits are portraits of people that you know, uh, hands down. And if it's a portrait of a loved one, good luck because that one that is just very very difficult um that is more difficult than anything i can imagine there um sometimes you know the most difficult angle jonas to paint is straightforward no tilt at all no angle is the most difficult to paint and i'll almost never do it people will almost never do it um it, it is just that uh it's torture by paint Painting torture. It's pain. It straightforward portraits puts the pain in paint. Let me tell you something. It puts the pain in paint. It makes me do this. It makes me worried, especially when um, I'm teaching in person, and someone starts to do that. They start to paint like this. Like the, I actually leave a gap. Whenever I paint in person, I leave a gap for the the center. Uh, and I tell people, no, stay away from that. Stay away from that because it, it is the most difficult and I do not recommend anyone do it. Uh, it's just not worth it um, because it's not worth it. All it is is, uh, it, is you're torturing yourself. You're just torturing yourself. You'll see very few old masters do that, actually, by the way. Very few. So from uh, Legendary Noob, how about something with charcoal and graphite again? You missed those videos. Possible possible i do have charcoal paper around here somewhere so that's possible very possible hey, hey janet oh thank you thank you for that comment hey zia mara oh good i'm glad it's funny i'm trying to uh trying to make sure that everyone remembers remembers what i'm saying now we're starting to add the light to the eyes and now i'm gonna mention something very important so um with ala prima if you start the way I did with those big blocks for the eye sockets, blocks for the nose, just big planes that are blocks, and you start to work around the features, it makes it much easier to identify where those critical shapes like the eyelids are going to go because everything around it is figured out. 
all the bigger stuff is figured out. So uh, what's important here to note is that the drawing in, in a linear fashion is almost non-existent. So what it means is that it's all done with mass. It's all done with mass. So, um, so if I go back to um, think about a square, right? A square is a mass that is contained within a line. But if you work with a mass, so if you work with just a big shape like this, it is actually easier to operate your drawing with. So the drawing in terms of the perspective and the placement of things becomes more intuitive when you're just pushing around uh, the paint. Well, thanks, Ziomara. Thank you. When you're pushing around the paint wet on wet and you have those large structures already established, it makes it much easier. Uh, a very famous painter, I'm pretty sure all of you know the name, John Singer Sargent, right? John Singer Sargent this, John Singer Sargent that. He would say that the features of the face are like spots to an apple. My favorite apple, by the way, is Honeycrisp. And um, uh, the um, shout out to all the Honeycrisp apples out there. I wish they weren't so expensive. Um, so the features of the face are like spots to an apple. If you can work the surrounding structures, even when you're drawing with lines, you're not going to go in typically with the eyelash or the eyeball and work your way around that. You can if you want to. It, it's a possibility. It's just hard. Uh, so now we're starting to add the highlights for the nose. Remember a while ago when I was talking about um, planes like mosaics? And then I said, eventually, I will start to add more paint in, which will make it more smooth. This is that time. So a long time ago, someone asked me about um, blending and how to create soft edges. You're watching it in real time. This is how you do it. Just like the song, this is how we do it. This is how we do it. So uh, we add the paint in deliberately. We add the plane in deliberately, like that. And then we smoothen out the shape in between them. Sergeant, right? There should be an apple named after John Singer Sergeant. So see how I'm adding the plane and then I'm smoothening out the plane around it. So I'm going to start using Lucy's notepad. So hopefully she doesn't get too mad at me. So um, these are two planes, right? These are two planes, one plane and another plane. And all you do is you smoothen out the edge in between the plane. This is key right here, everyone. That right there is exactly what I did. I put in the two planes, I delineated them first, and then I smoothen out the edge in between the plane. You see the feathering of the brush? I'm not trying to add a new plane because this squiggle is not a new plane. All it is is it's softening out the distinction between the plane. <laughs> yep, Christopher, this is the way. That's the way we do it. Yep, Ziomara. Uh, oh, good, Jonas. I'm glad you liked the explanation. So that and, and you see how the brush for the hairline actually went up from the skin tone into the hair. And that was actually the last touch, wasn't it? Nope, it wasn't. So I changed the camera angle and we're gonna see this in about three minutes. So I thought I was done, but I wasn't done. So I changed the camera angle, which changed the perspective for you. Um, so you can see it with less distortion. The camera is actually right in front of my face. So these are just the last minute touch-ups here. So um, with the hairline, everyone, always when the hair is wet, and the forehead is wet. Get the skin tone with the brush, with the flick of the wrist, move the uh, skin tone into the hair, and it will make a much more believable hairline than the uh, reverse, which would be hair down into forehead. 
The number one edge mistake I see everyone make is that they make the hairline too sharp. And if you make the hairline too sharp, it's going to look like uh, the model is wearing a wig. There are instances when it's sharp, like like this, like if you have long hair and it's like that, but even this is not as sharp as say like uh, the edge of like an iPad or something like that, right? This is a sharp edge. This is not a sharp edge. Always remember that everyone. Uh, let's see, Joey's the, um, let's see, we still got two minutes apparently, so I'm still doing more touch-ups to the edge there. Do the planes have to be different uh, temperatures? And I will say, um, I, I wouldn't think too much about temperature, but more about hue. Think about more of the color. And yeah, every plane changes the color change in theory, but I would I would focus and I would put more of my thinking into the plane or the the value first. First, start to think about the value, and then once you value becomes so intuitive to you. Then you can start thinking about hues, different hue variations. But I didn't really do too many hue variations, admittingly, with with uh, with this one. I'm glad you enjoyed this uh, this one, Sarah. And I'm taking a little bit of a gamble uh, on YouTube by painting this way a little bit more loosely, and um, it, it typically doesn't. It's not that popular on YouTube. People typically like that photorealism, which again is not actually realism, but it's more uh, human photocopier. But um, I'm typically trying to deliberately make this a little bit more expressive. I think that one was the last one. Almost. Should have been the last brushstroke there. All right, 30 seconds on the footage. Safe to say that that was the last brushstroke. So there you have it, everyone. But wait, there's more. So I'm going to pause it. So uh, if you're just tuning in or something, don't worry. The video is not going to end just yet because the painting was finished. We are going to go over the entire thing again. Because this is a live stream of a pre-recorded video, we're going to go over this yet again. So um, someone mentioned about uh, painting an emotion, uh, painting an expression. I think that's the one I'm going to stick with. I know that some of you wanted me to do landscape and um, still life, but the problem is every time I do landscape and still life, I lose so many viewers here. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a um, kind of difficult thing for me to do. Um, so... I'm not saying never, never say never. Perhaps I will do one in the future, but I think we're going to do one with a, an expression, like a surprise look or an angry look or something like that. Uh, I think that's what I'm going to look for for the next one. Uh, let's see. So, Christopher, what if there was a brushstroke uh, counter on the top left there? Brushstroke counter on the... Oh! Good idea. I don't know how on earth I could do that. I would need almost like an AI to do that for me. But that would be neat. Um, if I had a brushstroke counter on the top left, that would be awesome. I'm sure it's possible. And if anyone wants to count how many brushstrokes it takes, like how many licks does it take to get to the center of the Tootsie Pop? Fun factor. Um, uh, his name was... Um, oh, don't tell me I forgot his name. Don't tell me I forgot his name. No, it's been a long time. Dang it. Uh, but someone that went to the painting group that I used to go to in, uh, in, in, uh, Baltimore in Timonium a long time ago. I want to say his name was Gazim or something. Rest in peace. Um, he was a marketer. He worked in marketing, and he actually coined the term "How many licks does it take to get to the center of a tootsie pop?" I knew the guy that came up with that. Isn't that cool? So I knew the guy that came up with that. Um, so uh, anyway, um, how many brush strokes does it take to make this? I don't know. If you want to count it, go ahead. 
Uh, so from Joey Z, maybe a portrait with an expression with a landscape in the background. Whoa, now we're talking expression and landscape in background. Okay, I have written it down. Expression and landscape in the background. Now that will be a very expressive one, let me tell you. It probably will be less finished than this one. Um, hey, Ziomara. Oh, good. I'm glad you like the, the spontaneity in this one. Oh, good. I'm glad you like the inspiration. Thank you, Ziomara. You are my ideal. You are who I can describe the, uh, the perfect... Uh, viewer here uh, everyone here is amazing uh, but what the Omar has definitely pointed out is exactly what I want everyone to get out of this spontaneity in the painting inspiration um, inspiration is what I'm trying to get uh, everyone so that that's the key word right there everyone uh, so let's let's get into it now let's get into the uh, review of everything all of you are awesome all of you are the most amazing YouTube viewers on the planet, everyone here. Everyone watching this as a pre-recorded in the future, or those of you, uh, 43 of you watching this live, all of you are awesome. My favorite people in the whole wide world. So let's go back in the beginning. There was a blank canvas and a blank palette. At least the mixing space was blank. We worked with an active tone, so that tone had an influence on absolutely everything that we did. And uh, the, the tone that you choose is very important. So I chose a warm gray because I knew that it would go well with the, um, with the uh, colors that we would add on here. And I typically go with a gray. Uh, most of the time we'll go with a gray. And it's an active tone because it is wet. And then we got the silhouette with big, bold brush strokes. See, even the, there was a zigzag in the beginning. That's how mass oriented it is. I'm more focused with mass. Then what may scare most of you is we put in these dark shapes for the eye sockets of the eyes. We laid down the foundation for this. Without that, we wouldn't have been so quick to get that so this those big blobs laid down the foundation for that so going back to where we are what we're explaining those big blobs there with alla prima are done with very thick paint because as you start to add more paint so wet on wet paint it starts to become more and more Specific. So, for example, let me zoom you in as much as I can, as much as I can. Okay, you're zoomed in as much as I can zoom you in, and now you're going to see wet on wet paint. You see it? Wet on wet paint. Wet on wet paint. Now, that cannot happen without a thick layer of paint first. So I'm going to use my box to show you. My box right here, the Upari box is moving around here because I want you to focus there. So now notice how paint is added, wet on wet paint. So going back to that area, I haven't worked on it yet, there it is. Okay, that brush is a smaller brush. It's less thick paint. However, what I do to achieve that is I mix very thick paint and then I take some of it off with the paper towel. And wet on wet paint, now you see how the paint is being added into it. Not very much is going on, but it is easier to add onto that thicker foundation of paint because it's gripping on quite easily. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if I can, I'm going to, uh, this is always very hard to do, I'm going to get the camera angle back to what it was without the close-up. 
and uh, there we go. Hold on a second. I'm not the best tech savvy person in the world, if in case you haven't noticed. Okay, going back to where we were. Now, another important thing about Alla Prima, I'm going to mention to you, is the importance of your decision making with what shapes are done first. So, silhouette. Blobs for the placement of the face or the uh, features. Silhouette. Then your place markers for the features. They don't have to be perfect, remember them. Next. Accents. I went for dark accents around the face first. The perimeter of the face was easier for me to pinpoint with this particular pose. Then, the mask of the face. Then we worked our way from the mask of the face into the interior planes, the light planes of the mask of the face. And then we threw on the details for the eyes, very specifically looking for the things that made the biggest difference with the least amount of work. Always stand as far back as you can. And that's about it for Alla Prima that I got for you today. So you got the synopsis or the uh, you got the summary of the entire process. And then on top of that, you got to watch this entire thing be painted live in real time. Now, the important thing to get out of this is that this picture will be posted. Now, remember, the photograph is not going to look the same because the photograph was taken um, with, uh, you know, like, my camera setting on photo is different than my camera setting on video. But you're going to have this picture available for you completely for free on my Instagram so you can recreate this painting. And if you don't like this one, there's a bunch of other ones because there's a playlist. There should be a playlist in the description box with all of the information that you need. Um, so let's see, any comments that I missed here? Hey, Carla, I'm glad that you appreciate the uh, darker skin tone. That's something that I'm trying to, to work on here. From Zero Mara, I'm glad you learned a lot, especially the difference between uh, painting from life and from photograph with the micro expressions. Oh, good, good. Oh, and the atmosphere, of course, definitely Zio Mara. Jonas, I'm glad you like the Alla Prima painting tips. So Christopher Bobras had his canvas covered with white paint. Yep, the magic white paint. Who knows what goes into it? Just like who knows what goes into... Um... I'm not even going to go there. Anyway, who knows what goes into it? I'm not sure. So from Sarah, could you quickly go over your palette colors? Yep, sure, no problem. All right, so... Um... There is, look at my box here. So that is, to the right, is um, Flake White Replacement from Gamblin. That is Cadmium Yellow, either Gamblin or Winsor Newton. The rest of them are going to be either Gamblin or Winsor Newton. Indian Yellow. Cadmium Orange. Don't worry about these colors. I didn't use them. Those are just colors on uh, that I'm using for my online students. By the way, my online students... I don't start them off with all of these colors. For the beginning lessons, I actually start off with Burnt Sienna, Ultramarine Blue, and White. That's what I introduce. That's the palette I use for introductory um, painting students. Then we have Cadmium Red. Uh, cadmium Red, that is Cadmium Red Light. Which actually, if I'm going to be honest with you, that's Cadmium Red Vermilion, which is from Michael Harding. But it paints pretty much like cadmium red light from any other brand. I just already had the tube and I wanted to go through it. But my favorite red is cadmium red medium from Gamblin. So that is um, alizarin. Let's go this way. On the bottom there, that is alizarin permanent. That is, a, I believe that's a Gamblin color. Gamblin or Winsor Newton have it. On the bottom should be viridian, but it is a Verona green earth which is a Rublev color, R-U-B-L-E-V, 
Rublo. However, I don't recommend you use it. I don't. Because it's just not that strong of a green color. Viridian is the best green you can have on your palette. Which is why it's so expensive, unfortunately. Viridian is the best. That is Ultramarine Blue. That is Thalo Turquoise. Finally, we have Dioxazine Purple. Those are all my colors, consisting of the primaries and the secondaries. This is the point in the video where I ask if there are any last minute questions. And while I ask for the last minute questions, we're going to go back to my schedule again. Public service announcement here. Again, my online classes start out at $10 a month. And if you want to be on Zoom, if you want to hang out with me on Zoom tomorrow at 10 a.m., all you got to do is join the $10 a month um, tier today, like right now, if you want to. And you can hang out with me on Zoom. I won't be painting. We will just be having a... a a heart to heart conversation about what you would like me to paint on the online classes or if you just want to hang out with me that's perfect fine and i do this every other week which means next week we won't do it but the week after we will and the reason i'm doing that is so that i can get more feedback from you again my online classes start out at ten dollars a month the biggest thing is that you get feedback you have the opportunity to send me up to two images each week for this video right here, not that one, this one, the virtual classroom that is uploaded on Tuesdays around 2.30 p.m. It's a pre-recorded video where I give students feedback. And then if you want to join the uh, Zoom tiers, if you want to Zoom with me every week, there's the group Zoom that meets at 12 o'clock p.m. on Tuesday, which actually is going to be 15 minutes from now. And then uh, I got one-on-one -on -one Zooms, which are currently filled. Um, even though it says they're not filled, they're actually filled. A little technical difficulty there, but the one-on-one uh, -on -one ones are uh, filled there. That's my schedule. Let's see if there are any last-minute questions there. Thanks for watching, Sarah. Thanks for watching, Edgar. Thanks, Ziomara. Thank you, Jonas. I will see you next time. So remember, everyone, the picture will be posted in my Instagram. A link to that is in the description box of this video. And once I have enough inventory of paintings, I will have my own website, and you'll be able to get the pictures from there and buy the paintings if you want to, uh, because I will be selling them soon. I keep saying that, but... Once I have enough of these, um, I think I have probably like, I don't know, five of them now. I'm not sure. All right, so thank you so much for watching, everyone. Remember, the link to my online classes is in the description box of this video. What I should do, since a lot, since I know it's a lot to go through the description box, is I'll post it as a comment. It's the last thing I'll do. So there is my Patreon. I'll also pin it. I'll pin it so you can't miss it. So that is uh, how you can check out my online classes. Uh, feel free to click on that link. It is uh, to my online classes, and you can check that out if you're interested. Once again, thank you all so much for watching. Remember, the schedule is 10.15 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. 10.15 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time um, every Tuesday. So, uh, again, thank you so much for watching. I really hope that these videos are helping you out. I wish you the very best in all of your artwork, and I'll see you on the next one.